chapter twenty of the maid of scar this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the maid of scar by r d blackmore chapter twenty confidential intercourse but everybody must be tired of all this trouble about that boat it shows what a state of things we live in and what a meddlesome lot we are that a good man cannot receive a gift straight into his hands from providence which never before rewarded him though he said his prayers every night almost and did his very best to cheat nobody it proves at least to my mind something very rotten somewhere when a man of blameless character must prove his right to what he finds however i had proved my right and cut in colonel lower's woods a larger pole than usual because the law would guarantee me if at all assaulted and truly after all my care to be on the right side of it such a vile attack of law was now impending on me that with all my study of it when perpetual attempts to jam its helm up almost into the very eye of reason my sails very nearly failed to draw and left me shivering in the wind but first for what comes foremost at that particular moment all things seemed to be most satisfactory here was my property duly secured and most useful to me here was a run of fish up from the mumbles of a very superior character here was my own reputation spread by the vigilance of the public press so that i charged three farthings a pound more than sandy mac did and here was my cottage once more all alive with the mirth of our bunny and bardy to see them playing at hide-and-seek with two chairs and a table or french and english which i taught them or come and visit my grandmother or making a cat of the kettle-holder with a pair of ears and a tail to it or giving a noble dinner-party with cockles and oyster-shells and buttons and apple peel chopped finely or what was even a grander thing eating their own dinners prettily with their dolls beside them scarcely any one would have believed that these little ones had no mothers and yet they did not altogether seem to be forgetful or to view the world as if there were no serious side to it very grave discourse was sometimes held between their bouts of play and subjects of great depth and wonder introduced by dolls clothes for instance hasn't a got no mamma poor bunny to thread e needle no my dear i answered for my grandchild looks stupid about it poor bunny's mother is gone to heaven my mamma not gone to heaven my mamma come de morrow day i's almost tired of yating old davy but she sure to come de morrow day but as the brave little creature spoke i saw that the dust was in her eyes this was her own expression always to escape the reproach of crying when her lonely heart was working with its misty troubles and sent the tears into her eyes before the tongue could tell of them de morrow day de morrow day all her loss was to be recovered always on de morrow day not even so much as a doll had been saved from the total wreck of her fortunes and when i beheld her wistful eyes set one day upon bunny's doll although only fit for a hospital having one arm and one leg and no nose besides her neck being broken i set to at once and sharpened my knife upon a piece of sandstone then i sought out a piece of a beel laid by from the figurehead of a wrecked dutchman and in earnest i fell to and shaped such a carving of a doll as never was seen before or since of course the little pet came and stood and watched every chip as i sliced it along with sighs of deep expectancy and a laugh when i got to the tail of it and of course she picked up every one not only as 
neatest of the neat but also accounting them sacred offsets of the mysterious doll unborn i could not get her to go to bed and it was as good as a guinea to me to see the dancing in her eyes and the spring of her body returning e can make a boofly doll o oh, davy but e doesn't know the yea to dessa doll you are quite wrong there said i perceiving that i should go up or down according to my assertion and it made her open her eyes to see me cut out with about five snips a pair of drawers quite good enough for any decent woman and she went to bed hugging the doll in that state and praying to have her improved to-morrow at breakfast time mother jones dropped in for she loved a good salt herring and to lay down the law for the day almost as if i knew scarce anything and i always let her have her talk and listen to it gravely and clever women as a rule should not be denied of this attention for if they are it sours them while she was sucking the last of the tail and telling me excellent scandal my little lady marched in straight having finished her breakfast long ago and bearing her new doll pompously the fly-away colour in her cheeks which always made her beautiful and the sparkle of her gleeful eyes were come again with pleasure and so was the lovely pink of her lips and the proper aspect of her nose also she walked with such motherly rank throwing her legs with a female jerk it is enough for me to say that any newly married woman would have kissed her all round the room now mother jones having ten fine children five male and five female going about with clothes up to their forks need not have done what she did i think and made me so bashful in my own house for no sooner did she see this doll than she cried oh my and covered up her face the little maid looked up at me in great wonder as if i were leading her astray and i felt so angry with mrs jones after all the things i had seen abroad and even in english churches that i would not trust myself to speak however to pay her out for that i begged her to cure the mischief herself which she could not well decline and some of the green blinds still remaining dolly became a most handsome sight with a crackle in front and a sweeping behind so that our clerk a good-natured man was invited to christen her and patty green was the name he gave and bunny's doll was nobody such a baby-like thing might seem almost below my dignity and that of all the rest of us only this child had the power to lead us as by a special enchantment back to our own childhood moreover it was needful for me to go through with this doll's birth still more so with her dress of course having her a female because through her i learned a great deal more of bardie's history than ever our bunny could extract everybody who has no patience with the ways of childhood may be vexed and must be vexed with our shipwrecked maid for knowing many things but not the right but i think she was to blame only for her innocence in her tiny brain was moving some uncertain sense of wrong whether done by herself or to her was beyond her infant groping if she could have made her mind up in its little milky shell that the evil had befallen without harm on her part doubtless she had done her best to let us know the whole of it her best of course would be but little looking at her age and so on and perhaps from some harsh word or frown stamped into the tender flux of infantile memory a heavy dread both darkened and repressed much recollection hence if one tried to examine her in order to find out who she was she would shake her head and say no something 
as she always did when puzzled or unable to pronounce a word the only chance of learning even any little thing she knew was to leave her to her own way and not interrupt her conversation with wooden or crockery playmates all of these she endowed with life having such power of life herself and she reckoned them up for good behaviour or for bad as the case might be and often was i touched at heart after a day of bitter fighting with a world that wronged me by hearing her in baby prattle tell her playthings of their unkindness to a little thing with none to love her but when i had finished patty's face up to complete expression with two black buttons for her eyes and a cowrie for her mouth and a nose of coral also a glorious head of hair of crinkled seaweed growing out of her shell tooth like an ivory comb almost the ecstasy of the child was such that i obtained as well as deserved some valuable information patty geen e's been i good i heard her say in my window place one morning after breakfast and e is the most boofly doll ever seen and i tell a somefin only e mustn't tell anybody till my dear mamma comes nat wasn't ickle bother patty how do you know miss patty inquired by means of my voice in the distance and a little art i had learned abroad of throwing it into corners i tell a patter i tell a i could a tell e nasty man but i tell old davy some day it could bother not like nat at all it could bother not so big enough and only two ickle teeth in front and his hair all gone ah uh, yea it is but mamma say soon come back again and what is little brother's name said patty in a whisper and what is your name and papa's oh e silly patty geen as if e didn't know i's bardie ever since i was any tin and papa is papa he is patty i's kite ashamed of a he's such a silly ickle fin well i know i'm not very clever miss but tell me some more things you remember i tell e if e'd stop quiet i is so many happy turns of the day miss bardie many happy turns of the day to ah uh, and poor bardie get off her stool and say what her dear papa tell gentiums and yadies i i much obliged to ya and then have boofly appledies and carbies and a ickle dop a good yiny piny does he know hot that means poor patty no my dear how should i know he mustn't call me my dear i tell a he must know a space in yife why he's only a doll patty and bardie's a young yady and a streamly conscious gal i is and the gentiums all say so ickle bother can't say nothin without me to sew him the yea of it but bardie say almost anything anything when i yikes to try bardie say palmiolianian dog this cost her a long breath and a great effort but patty expressed intense amazement at such power of diction and begged to know something more about that extraordinary animal pomiolianian dog is yite yite all over cept his collar and his collar's boo and he's got hair that long patty ever so much longer than yours and he yun round and yound he does oh i do so yant my pomiolianian dog patty waited for two great tears to run quietly down two little cheeks and then she expressed some contempt of the dog and a strong desire to hear some more about the happy turns of the day don't be be jealous now patty i tell e e ickle yite dog can eat but e can't and happy turns of the day is yen a gate big gal is two years old with a ickle bother and e can't say nuffin cause he grow too strong enough and e young lady must repie and i buddy ukes at a and yaffs and put e gasses up and say hot a conscious ickle fin and my dear papa say hot a good gal and mamma come and tis a uh, all o'er a most and then e all have some more puddin'y pie 
overcome with that last memory she could go no further and being unable to give her pies i felt myself bound to abandon any more inquiries for that child scarcely ever roared so as to obtain relief but seemed with a kind of self-control such as unlucky people form however early in their lives to take her troubles inwardly and to be full to the very lip of them without the power of spilling this though a comfort to other people is far worse for themselves i fear and i knew that she did love pastry rarely for one day after a fine pair of soles i said to the two children now put your little hands together and thank god for a good dinner bunny did this in a grateful manner but bardie said no i own old davy i'll thank god when i gets puddin'y pie upon the whole i concluded thus that the little creature was after all and as might have been expected with any other child almost too young in the third year of her age to maintain any clear ideas of place or time or names or doings or anything that might establish from her own words only whence she came or who she was however i now knew quite enough if the right people ever came to seek for her to dentify her as she expressed it to that stupid coroner moxie thomas came to fetch her back to scar in a few days time i was now resolved to keep her and she resolved to stay with me and doubtless i had first right to her but when i saw poor moxie's face and called to mind her desolation and when she kissed my fishy hand to let her have this comfort after all the lord had taken from her i could not find it in my heart to stand to my own interest it came across me too that bardie scarcely throve on so much fish and we never had any butcher's meat or meat of any kind at all unless i took shares in a pig after saving up money for christmas or contrived to defend myself against the hares that would run at me so when i happened to come through a gate at night so with a clearly pronounced brave roar having more music than bunnies in it and enough to wash a great deal of dust out of her woefully lingering eyes away she went in moxie's arms with patty green in her own looking likely to get wet through and bunny stuck her thumbs into my legs which she had a knack of doing especially after sucking them so thus we stood at our cottage door looking after bardie and i took off my hat and she spread her hand out in the intervals of woe and little thought either of us i dare say of the many troubles in store for us both only before that grievous parting she had done a little thing which certainly did amaze me and if anybody knows the like i shall be glad to hear of it i had a snug and tidy locker very near the fireplace wherein i kept some little trifles such as bunny had an eye for but was gradually broken into distant admiration one morning i came suddenly in from looking to my night lines and a pretty scene i saw the door of my cupboard was wide open and there stood little bardy giving a finishing lick to her fingers bunny also in the corner with her black eyes staring as if at the end of the world itself however her pinafore was full no sooner did my grandchild see me than she rushed away with shrieks casting down all stolen goods in agony of conscience i expected bardie to do the same but to my great wonderment up she walked and faced me must i beat poor patty Geen? the tears were in her eyes at having to propose so sad a thing and she stroked the doll to comfort her beat poor patty said i in amazement why what harm has patty done ne'er she have been all e time stealing a sugar old davy and she looked at me as if she had done a good turn by the information i scarcely knew what to do i declare for her doll was so truly alive to her that she might and perhaps did believe it however i shut her in my little bedroom until her heart was almost broken and then i tried to reason with her on the subject of telling lies but she could not understand what they were until i said 
what i was forced to do when i went among bad people that evening after she was gone and while i was very dull about it finding poor bunny so slow and stupid and nothing to keep me wide awake there i was bound to be wide awake more than at petty sessions even when mine enemies throng against me for almost before i had smoked two pipes or made up my mind what to do with myself finding a hollow inside of me the great posting-coach from bridgend came up with the sun setting bright on its varnish and at my very door it stopped next to the driver sat a constable who was always unjust to me and from the inside came out first justice anthony stew of pen coed as odious and as meddlesome a justice of the peace as ever signed a warrant and after him came a tall elderly gentleman on whom i had never set eyes before but i felt that he must be a magistrate End of chapter twenty chapter twenty one of the maid of scar this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the maid of scar by r d blackmore chapter twenty one cross examination those justices of the peace although appointed by his majesty have never been a comfort to me saving only colonel lor they never seem to understand me or to make out my desires or to take me at my word as much as i take them at theirs my desire has always been to live in a painfully loyal manner to put up with petty insults from customers who know no better leaving them to self-reflection and if possible to repentance while i go my peaceful way nor let them hear their money jingle or even spend it in their sight to be pleased and trustful also with the folk who trust in me and rather to abandon much and give back tuppence in a shilling than cause any purchaser self-reproach for having sworn falsely before the bench now if all this would not do to keep me out of the session books can any man point out a clearer proof of the vicious administration of what they call justice around our parts and when any trumpery case was got up on purpose to worry and plague me the only chance left me of any fair play was to throw up my day's work and wear out my shoes in trudging to candleston court to implore that good colonel lower to happen to sit on the bench that day when those two gentlemen alighted from that rickety old coach and ordered that very low constable to pace to and fro at the door of my house boldly i came out to meet them having injured no man nor done harm of any sort that i could think of lately stew came first a man of no lineage but pushed on by impudence anthony stew can look you through an english poacher said of him and this he tried always to do with me and thoroughly welcome he was to succeed i will not say that my inner movements may not have been uneasy in spite of all my rectitude however i showed their two worships inside in the very host style of the quarter-deck such as i had gathered from that coroneted captain my proud connection with whom perhaps i may have spoken of ere this or at any rate ought to have done so for i had the honour of swabbing his pumps for him almost every morning and he was kind enough to call me davy every briton in his own house is bound to do his utmost so i touched my grey forelock and made two good bows and set a chair for each of them happening to have no more just now though with plenty of money to buy them self-controlled as i always am many things have tried me of late almost to the verge of patience such imputations as fall most tenderly on a sorrowful widower 
and my pure admiration of bardie and certainty of her lofty birth had made me the more despise such foulness so it came to pass that two scandalous men were given over by the doctors for the pole i had cut was a trifle too thick nevertheless they recovered bravely and showed no more gratitude towards god than to take out warrants against me but their low devices were frustrated by the charge being taken before colonel lower and what did that excellent magistrate do he felt himself compelled to do something therefore he fined me a shilling per head for the two heads broken with ten shillings costs which he paid as usual and gave me a very severe reprimand llewellyn he said the time has come for you to leave off this course of action i do not wonder that you felt provoked but you must seek for satisfaction in the legal channels suppose these men had possessed thin heads why you might have been guilty of murder make out his commitment to cardiff jail in default of immediate payment all this was good and sustained one's faith in the efficacy of british law and trusting that nothing might now be amiss in the minds of these two magistrates i fetched the block of sycamore whereupon my fish were in the habit of having their fins and tails chopped off and there i sat down and presented myself both ready and respectful on the other hand my visitors looked very grave and silent whether it were to prolong my doubts or as having doubts of their own perhaps your worships i began at last in fear of growing timorous with any longer waiting your worships must have driven far to see you llewellyn squire stew said with a nasty snap hoping the more to frighten me not only a pleasure to me your worships but a very great honour to my poor house what will your worships be pleased to eat butcher's meat i would have had if only i had known of it but one thing i can truly say my cottage has the best of fish that i can believe said stew because you sell all the worse to me another such a trick llewellyn and i have you in the stocks this astonished me so much for his fish had never died over four days that nothing but my countenance could express my feelings i crave your pardon justice stew said the tall grey gentleman with the velvet coat as he rose in a manner that overawed me for he stood a good foot over anthony stew and a couple of inches over me may we not enter upon the matter which has led us to this place certainly sir philip certainly stew replied with a style which proved that sir philip must be of no small position all i meant sir philip was just to let you see the sort of fellow we have to deal with my integrity is well known i answered turning from him to the gentleman not only in this parish but for miles and miles round it is not my habit to praise myself and in truth i find no necessity even a famous newspaper so far away as bristol the celebrated felix farley's journal just so said the elder gentleman it is that which has brought us here although as i fear on a hopeless errand with these words he leaned away as if he had been long accustomed to be disappointed to me it was no small relief to find their business peaceable and that neither a hare which had rushed at me like a lion through a gate by moonlight nor a stupid covey of partridges nineteen in number which gave me no peace well excluded from my dripping pan nor even a pheasant cock whose crowing was of the most insulting tone that none of these had been complaining to the bench emboldened me and renewed my sense of reason but i felt that justice stew could not be trusted for a moment to take this point in a proper light therefore i kept my wits in the chains taking soundings of them both 
now llewellyn no nonsense mind began squire stew with his face like a hatchet and scollops over his eyebrows what we are come for is very simple and need not unsettle your conscience as you have allowed it to do i fear keep your aspect of innocent wonder for the next time you are brought before me i only wish your fish were as bright and slippery as you are may i humbly ask what matter it pleases your worship to be thinking of oh of course you cannot imagine davy but let that pass as you were acquitted by virtue of your innocent face in the teeth of all the evidence if you had only dropped your eyes instead of wondering so much but never mind stare as you may some day we shall be sure to have you now i will put it to anybody whether this was not too bad in my own house and with the bench seated on my own best chairs however knowing what a man he was and how people do attribute to me things i never dreamed of and what little chance a poor man has if he takes to contradiction all i did was to look my feelings which were truly virtuous nor were they lost upon sir philip you will forgive me good sir i hope he said to squire anthony but unless we are come with any charge against this mr llewellyn it is hardly fair to reopen any awkward questions of which he has been acquitted in his own house moreover and when he has offered kind hospitality to us in a word i will say no more here he stopped for fear perhaps of vexing the other magistrate and i touched my grizzled curl and said sir i thank you for a gentleman this was the way to get on with me instead of driving and bullying for a gentleman or a lady can lead me to any extremes of truth but not a lawyer much less a justice and anthony stew had no faith in truth unless she came out to his own corkscrew british tar he exclaimed with his nasty sneer now for some more of your heroism you look as if you were up for doing something very glorious i have seen that colour in your cheeks when you sold me a suin that shone in the dark a glorious exploit wasn't it now that it was your worship to such a customer as you while anthony stew was digesting this which seemed a puzzle to him the tall grey gentleman feeling but little interest in my commerce again desires to hurry matters forgive me again i beseech you good sir but ere long it will be dark and as yet we have learned nothing leave it all to me sir philip your wisest plan is to leave it to me i know all the people around these parts and especially this fine fellow i have made a sort of study of him because i consider him what i may call a thoroughly typical character i am not a typical character i answered over hastily for i found out afterwards what he meant i never tipple but when i drink my rule is to go through with it squire stew laughed aloud at my mistake as if he had been a great scholar himself and even sir philip smiled a little in his sweet and lofty manner no doubt but i was vexed for a moment scenting though i could not see error on my own part but now i might defy them both ever to write such a book as this for vanity has always been so foreign to my nature that i am sure to do my best and after all think nothing of it so long as people praise me and now in spite of all rude speeches if sir philip had only come without that squire anthony not a thing of all that happened would i have retained from him it is hopeless for people to say that my boat cripples speech on my part tush i would have pulled her plug out on the tail of the tusker rather than one moment stand against the light for bardie 
squire stew asked me all sorts of questions having no more substance in them than the blowing hole at the end of an egg or the bladder of a skate-fish all of these i answered boldly finding his foot outside my shoes and so he came back again as they do after trying foolish excursions to the very point he started with am i to understand my good fellow that the ship which at least you allow to be wrecked may have been or might have been something like a foreigner therein lies the point where on your worship cannot follow me any more than could the coroner neither he nor his clerk nor the rest of the jury would listen to common sense about it that ship no more came from appledore than a whale was hatched from a herring's egg i knew it i knew it broke in sir philip they have only small coasters at appledore i said that the newspaper must be wrong however for the sake of my two poor sons i am bound to leave no clue unfollowed there is nothing more to be done mr stew except to express my many and great obligations for your kindness herewith he made a most stately bow and gave even me a corner of it stay sir philip one moment more this fellow is such a crafty file certain i am that he never would look so unnaturally frank and candid unless he were in his most slippery mood you know the old proverb i dare say put a taffy on his metal he'll boil old nick in his own fish kettle die you where did your boat come from this question he put in a very sudden and i might well say vicious manner darting a glance at me like the snake's tongues in the island of das cobras i felt such contempt that i turned my back and gave him a view of the boofly buckins admired so much by bardie well done he cried your resources dio are an infinite credit to you and do you know when i see your back i can almost place some faith in you it is broad and flat and sturdy dio ah many a fine hair has swung their head downwards nevertheless we must see this boat nothing irritates me more than what low englishmen call chaff i like to be pleasant and jocular upon other people but i don't like that sort of thing tried upon me when i am not in the humour for it therefore i answered crustily your worship is welcome to see my boat and go to sea in her if you please with the plug out of her bottom under porth call point she lies and all the people there know all about her only i will beg your worship to excuse my presence lest you should have low suspicions that i came to twist their testimony well said david well said my fine fellow almost i begin to believe thee in spite of all experience now sir philip your pardon good sir i follow you into the carriage so off they set to examine my boat and i hope to see no more of them for one thing was certain to wit that their coachman never would face the sand-hills and no road ever is or ever can be to porth call so that these two worthy gentlemen needs must exert their noble legs for at least one half of the distance and knowing that squire stew's soles were soft i thought it a blessing for him to improve the only soft part about him End of chapter twenty one chapter twenty two of the maid of scar this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the maid of scar by r d blackmore chapter twenty two another disappointment 
highly pleased with these reflections what did i do but take a pipe and sit like a lord at my own doorway having sent poor bunny with a smack to bed because she had shown curiosity for this leading vice of the female race cannot be too soon discouraged but now i began to fear almost that it would be growing too dark very soon for me to see what became of the carriage returning with those two worships moreover i felt that i had no right to let them go so easily without even knowing sir philip's surname or what might be the especial craze which had led them to honour me so and sundry other considerations slowly prevailed over me until it would have gone sore with my mind to be kept in the dark concerning them so when heavy dusk of autumn drove in over the notch of sandhills from the far away of sea and the green of grass was gone and you hardly could tell a boy from a girl among the children playing unless you knew their mothers i rejoicing in their pleasures quite forgot the justices for all our children have a way of letting out their liveliness such as makes old people feel a longing to be in with them not like bardie of course but still a satisfactory feeling and the better my tobacco grew the sweeter were my memories before i had courted my wife and my sweethearts a dozen and a half perhaps or at the outside say two dozen anything more than twice apiece in the gentle cut of memory and with very quiet sighs indeed for echoes of great thumping ones and just as i wondered what execution a beautiful child with magnificent legs would do when i lay in the churchyard all of a heap i was fetched out of dreaming into common sense again there was the great yellow coach at the corner of the old grey wall that stopped the sand and all the village children left their hide-and-seek to whisper having fallen into a different mood from that of curiosity and longing only for peace just now or tender styles of going back went i into my own cottage hoping to hear them smack whip and away even my hand was on the bolt for a bolt i had now on account of the cats who understand every manner of latch wherever any fish be and perhaps it is a pity that i did not shoot it but there came three heavy knocks and i scarcely had time to unbutton my coat in proof of their great intrusion before i was forced to show my face and beg to know their business now dio dio said that damned stew saving your presence i can't call him else this is a little too bad of you retiring ere dusk aha aha and how many hours after midnight will you keep your hornpipes up among the jolly sailors great davy i admire you i saw that it was not in his power to enter into my state of mind nor could i find any wit in his jokes supposing them to be meant for such well what did your worships think of porthcall i asked after setting the chairs again while i bustled about for my tinder-box did you happen to come across the man whose evil deeds are always being saddled upon me we found a respectable worthy scotchman whose name is alexander macraw and who told us more in about five minutes than we got out of you in an hour or more he has given us stronger reason to hope that we may be on the right track at last to explain a most painful mystery and relieve sir philip from the most cruel suspense and anxiety at these words of squire anthony the tall grey gentleman with the velvet coat bowed and would fain have spoken but feared perhaps that his voice would tremble macraw thinks it highly probable justice stew continued 
that the ship though doubtless a foreigner may have touched on the opposite coast for supplies after a long ocean voyage and though sir philip has seen your boat and considers it quite a stranger that proves nothing either way as the boat of course would belong to the ship but one very simple and speedy way there is of settling the question you thought proper to conceal the fact that the coroner had committed to your charge as foreman of the jury and a precious jury it must have been so as to preserve near the spot in case of any inquiry the dress of the poor child washed ashore this will save us the journey to scar which in the dusk would be dangerous david llewellyn produce that dress under my authority that i will your worship with the greatest pleasure i am sure i would have told you all about it if i had only thought of it ahem was all squire stew's reply for a horribly suspicious man hates such downright honesty but without taking further notice of him i went to my locker of old black oak and thence i brought that upper garment something like a pinafore the sight of which had produced so strong an effect upon the coroner it was made of the very finest linen and perhaps had been meant for the child to wear in lieu of a frock in some hot climate as i brought this carefully up to the table squire stew cried light another candle just as if i kept the village shop this i might have done at one time if it had only happened to me at the proper period to marry the niece of the man that lived next door to the chapel where they dried the tea-leaves she took a serious liking to me with my navy trousers on but i was fool enough to find fault with a little kink in her starboard eye i could have carried on such a trade with my knowledge of what people are and description of foreign climates however it was not to be and i had to buy my candles as soon as we made a fine strong light both the gentlemen came nigh and sir philip who had said so little even now forbore to speak i held the poor dress tattered by much beating on the points of rocks and as i unrolled it slowly he withdrew his long white hands lest we should remark their quivering you are not such fools as i thought said stew it is a coronet beyond doubt i can trace the lines and crossings though the threads are frayed a little and here in the corner a money grum ah you never saw that you stoops do you know the marks sir i do not sir philip answered and seemed unable to fetch more words and then like a strong man turned away to hide all disappointment even anthony stew had the manners to feel that here was a sorrow beyond his depth and he covered his sense of it like a gentleman by some petty talk with me and it made me almost respect him to find that he dropped all his banter as out of season but presently the tall grey gentleman recovered from his loss of hope and with a fine brave face regarded us and his voice was firm and very sweet it is not right for me to cause you pain by my anxieties and i fear that you will condemn me for dwelling upon them overmuch but you mr stew already know and you my friend have a right to know after your kind and ready help that it is not only the piteous loss of two little innocent children very dear ones both of them but also the loss of fair repute to an honourable family and the cruel suspicion cast upon a fine brave fellow who would scorn sir who would scorn for the wealth of all this kingdom to hurt the hair of a baby's head here sir philip's voice was choked with indignation more than sorrow and he sat down quickly and waved his hand as much as to say i am an old fool i had much better not pretend to talk and much as i longed to know all about it of course it was not my place to ask 
exactly my dear sir exactly squire anthony went on for the sake of saying something i understand you my dear sir and feel for you and respect you greatly for your manly fortitude under this sad calamity trust in providence my dear sir as indeed i need not tell you i will do my best but this is now the seventh disappointment we have had it would have been a heavy blow of course to have found the poor little fellow dead but even that with the recovery of the other would have been better than this dark mystery and above all would have freed the living from these maddening suspicions but as it is we must try to bear it and to say god's will be done but i am thinking too much about ourselves mr stew i am very ungrateful not to think more of your convenience you must be longing to be at home at your service sir philip quite at your service my time is entirely my own this was simply a bit of brag and i saw that he was beginning to fidget for bold as his worship was on the bench we knew that he was but a coward at board where mrs stew ruled with a rod of iron and now it was long past dinner-time even in the finest houses one thing more then before we go answered sir philip rising according to the newspaper and as i hear one young maiden was really saved from that disastrous shipwreck i wish we could have gone on to see her but i must return to-morrow morning having left many anxious hearts behind and to cross the sands in the dark they say is utterly impossible not at all sir philip said i very firmly for i honestly wish to go through with it although the sand is very deep there is no fear at all if one knows the track it is only the cowardice of these people ever since the sandstorm i would answer to take you in the darkest night if only i had ever learned to drive but anthony stew broke in with a smile it would grieve me to sit behind you dio and i trow that sir philip would never behold appledore again there is nothing these sailors will not attempt although i could sit the bow thwart of a cart very well with a boy to drive me and had often advised the hand at the tiller and sometimes as much as held the whip all this to my diffidence seemed too little to warrant me in navigating a craft that carried two horses sir philip looked at me and perhaps he thought that i had not the cut of a coachman however all he said was this in spite of your kindness mr stew and your offer my good sir this was to me with much dignity i perceive that we must not think of it and of what use could it be except to add new troubles to old ones sir i have trespassed too much on your kindness in a minute i will follow you anthony stew being thus addressed was only too glad to skip into the carriage bye bye dio he cried mend your ways if you can my man i think you have told fewer lies than usual knock off one every time of speaking and in ten years you will speak the truth of this low rubbish i took no heed any more than any one would who knows me especially as i beheld sir philip signalling with his purse to me so that stew might not be privy to it entering into the spirit of this i had some pleasant memories of gentlemanly actions done by the superior classes towards me but longer agone than i could have desired and now being out of the habit of it i showed some natural reluctance to begin again unless it were really worth my while sir philip understood my feelings and i rose in his esteem so that half guineas went back to his pocket and guineas took the place of them mr llewellyn i know he said that you have served your country well and it grieves me to think that on my account you have met with some harsh words to-day 
if your worship only knew how little a thing of that sort moves me when i think of the great injustice but i suppose it must be expected by a poor man such as i am justice too is spoiled by having so many rogues to deal with i always make allowance for him and of course i know that he likes to play with the lofty character i bear if i had his house and his rich estate but it does not matter after all what are we ah you may well say that llewellyn two months ago i could not have believed but who are we to find fault with the doings of our maker all will be right if we trust in him although it is devilish hard to do but that poor maid at that wretched place what is to become of her she has me to look after her your worship and she shall not starve while i have a penny bravely said llewellyn my son is a sailor and i understand them i know that i can trust you fully to take charge of a trifle for her i love the maid i answered truly i would sooner rob myself than her of course you would after saving her life i have not time to say much to you only take this trifle for the benefit of that poor thing from a red leathern bag he took out ten guineas and hastily plunged them into my hand not wishing stew to have knowledge of it but i was desirous that everybody should have the chance to be witness of it and so i held my hand quite open and just at that moment our bunny snored what have you children yourself llewellyn i thought that you were an old bachelor an ancient widower your worship with a little grandchild and how to keep her to the mark with father nun and mother nun quite takes me off my head sometimes let me light your honour to your carriage not for a moment if you please i wish i had known all this before mr stew never told me a word of this it would have been strange if he had said i he is always so bitter against me because he can never prove anything then llewellyn you must oblige me spend this trifle on clothes and things for that little snorer he gave me a little crisp affair feeling like a child's call dried and i thought it was no more than that however i touched my brow and thanked him as he went to the carriage steps and after consulting all the village i found it a stanch pledge from the government for no less than five pounds sterling End of chapter 22chapter twenty three of the maid of scar this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the maid of scar by r d blackmore chapter twenty three into good society in spite of all that poor landsmen say about equinoctial gales and so on we often have the loveliest weather of all the year in september if this sets in it lasts sometimes for three weeks or a month together then the sky is bright and fair with a firm and tranquil blue not so deep of tint or gentle as the blue of springtide but more truly staid and placid and far more trustworthy the sun both when he rises over the rounded hills behind the cliffs and when he sinks into the level of the width of waters shines with ripe and quiet lustre to complete a year of labour as the eastern in the morning so at sunset the western heaven glows with an even flush of light through the entire depth pervading and unbroken by any cloud then at dusk the dew fog wavers in white stripes over the meadowland or in winding combs benighted pillows down and leaves its impress a sparkling path for the sun's return to my mind no other part of the year is pleasanter than this end of harvest with golden stubble and orchards gleaming and the hedgerows turning red then fish are in season and fruit is wholesome and the smell of sweet brewing is rich on the air 
this beautiful weather it was that tempted colonel lougher and lady bluett to take a trip for the day to sker the distance from candleston court must be at least two good leagues of sandy road or rather of sand without any road for a great part of the journey therefore instead of their heavy coach they took a light two-wheeled car and a steady-going pony which was very much wiser of them also which was wiser still they had a good basket of provisions intending to make a long seaside day and expecting a lively appetite i saw them pass through newton as i chanced to be mending my nets by the well and i touched my hat to the colonel of course and took it off to the lady the colonel was driving himself so as not to be cumbered with any servant and happening to see such a basket of food i felt pretty sure there would be some over for the quality never eat like us then it came into my memory that they could not bear evan thomas and it struck me all of a sudden that it might be well worth my while to happen to meet them upon their return before they passed any poor houses as well as to happen to be swinging an empty basket conspicuously it was a provident thought of mine and turned out as well as its foresight deserved they passed a very pleasant day at sker as i was told that evening pushing about among rocks and stones and routing out this that and the other of shells and seaweed and starfish and all the rest of the rubbish such as amuses great gentry because they have nothing to do for their living and though money is nothing to them they always seem to reckon what they find by money value not colonel lougher of course i mean and even less lady bluett i only speak of some grand people who come raking along our beach and of all of these there was nobody with the greediness anthony stew had a crab that had died in changing his shell would hardly come amiss to him let that pass who cares about him i wish to speak of better people the colonel though he could not keep ill-will against any one on earth did not choose to be indebted to scar grange for even so much as a bite of hay for his pony partly perhaps that he might not appear to play false to his own tenantry for the nottage farmers who held of the colonel were always at feud with evan thomas therefore he baited the pony himself after easing off some of the tackle and moored him to an ancient post in a little sheltered hollow their rations also he left in the car for even if any one did come by none would ever think of touching this good magistrate's property quite early in the afternoon their appetites grew very brisk by reason of the crisp sea breeze and sparkling freshness of the waves accordingly after consultation they agreed that the time was come to see what crumpy their honest old butler had put into the basket the colonel held his sister's hand to help her up rough places and breasting a little crest of rushes they broke upon a pretty sight which made them both say hush and wonder in a hollow place of sand spread with dry white bones skates pouches blades of cuttlefish sea snail shells and all the other things that storm and sea drive into and out of the sands a very tiny maid was sitting holding audience all alone she seemed to have no sense at all of loneliness or of earthly trouble in the importance of the moment and the gravity of play before her sat three little dolls arranged according to their rank cleverly posted in chairs of sand the one in the middle was patty green the other two strange imitations fashioned by young watkins knife each was urging her claim to shells which the mistress was dispensing fairly and with good advice to each then laughing at herself and them and trying to teach them a nursery song which broke down from forgetfulness and all the while her quick bright face and the crisp grain of her attitudes and the jerk of her thick short curls were enough to make any one say what a queer little soul therefore it is not to be surprised at that colonel lougher could not make her out or that while he was feeling about for his eyeglasses of best crystal his sister was as behooves a female rasher to express opinion for she had lost a little girl and sometimes grieved about it still 
what a queer little dear little thing henry i never saw such a child where can she have dropped from did you see any carriage come after us it is useless to tell me that she can belong to any of the people about here look at her forehead and look at her manners and how she touches everything now did you see that what a wonderful child every movement is grace and delicacy oh you pretty darling her ladyship could wait no longer for the colonel's opinion which he was inclined to think of ere he should come out with it and she ran down the sand-hill almost faster than became her dignity but if she had been surprised before how was she astonished now at bardie's reception of her Dunna tush ni tushy pa si vous pay ali dollies is ye good just going to dinny and he mustn't pour their appetites and the little adam arose and moved lady bluett's skirt out of her magic circle and then having saved her children she stood scarcely up to the lady's knee and looked at her as much as to ask are you of the quality and being well satisfied on that point she made what the lady declared to be the most elegant curtsey she ever had seen meanwhile the colonel was coming up in a dignified manner and leisurely perceiving no cause to rush through rushes and knowing that his sister was often too quick this had happened several times in the matter of beggars and people on crutches and skin collectors and such like who cannot always be kept out of the way of ladies and his worship the colonel had been compelled to endeavour to put a stop to it therefore as the best man in the world cannot in reason be expected to be in a moment abreast with the sallies of even the best womankind but likes to see to the bottom of it the colonel came up crustily eleanor can you not see that the child does not wish for your interference her brothers and sisters are sure to be here from kenfig most likely or at any rate some of her relations and busy perhaps with our basket no said the child looking up at him i's got no lations now all gone aye but i'll come back de morrow day why henry what are we thinking of this must be the poor little girl that was wrecked and i wanted you so to come down and see her but you refused on account of her being under the care of farmer thomas no my dear not exactly that but on account of the trouble in the house i did not like to appear to meddle whatever your reason was answered the lady no doubt you were quite right but now i must know more of this poor little thing come and have some dinner with us my darling i am sure you must be hungry don't be afraid of the colonel he loves little children when they are good but poor bardie hung down her head and was shy which never happened to her with me or any of the common people she seemed to know as if by instinct that she was now in the company of her equals lady bluett however was used to children and very soon set her quite at ease by inviting her dolls and coaxing them and listening to their histories and all the other little turns that unlock the hearts of innocence so it came to pass that the castaway dined in good society for the first time since her great misfortune here she behaved so prettily and i might say elegantly that colonel lower who was of all men the most thoroughly just and upright felt himself bound to confess his error in taking her for a kenfig nobody now as it happened to be his birthday the lady had ordered mr crumpy the butler to get a bottle of the choicest wine and put it into the hamper without saying anything to the colonel so that she might drink his health and persuade him to do himself the like good turn having done this she gave the child a drop in the bottom of her own wine-glass which the little one tossed off most fluently and with a sigh of contentment said i's not had a dop o that yiny piny ever since somethin why what wine do you call it my little dear the colonel asked being much amused with her air of understanding it doesn't a know she replied with some pity nat's hot i calls a dop a good sampain give her some more said the colonel upon my word she deserves it eleanor you were right about her she is a wonderful little thing 
all the afternoon they kept her with them being more and more delighted with her as she began to explain her opinions and watty who came to look after her was sent home with a shilling in his pocket and some of the above i learned from him and some from mr crumpy who was a very great friend of mine and apart from little bardie and the rest even from her good ladyship except what trifles i add myself being gifted with power of seeing things that happen in my absence this power has been in my family for upwards of a thousand years coming out and forming great bards sometimes and at other times great story-tellers therefore let no one find any fault or doubt any single thing i tell them concerning some people who happen just now to be five or six shelves in the world above me for i have seen a great deal of the very highest society when i cleaned my earl's pumps and epaulets and waited upon him at breakfast and i know well how those great people talk not from observation only but by aid of my own fellow-feeling for them which perhaps owes its power of insight not to my own sagacity only but to my ancestors lofty positions as poets to royal families now although i may have mentioned this to the man of the press whose hat appeared to have undergone press experience i have otherwise kept it quite out of sight because every writer should hold himself entirely round the corner and discover his hand but not his face to as many as kindly encourage him of late however it has been said not by people of our own parish who have seen and heard me at the well and elsewhere but by persons with no more right than power to form opinions that i cannot fail of breaking down when i come to describe great people to these my answer is quite conclusive from my long connection with royalty lasting over a thousand years i need not hesitate to describe the prince of wales himself and inasmuch as his royal highness is not of pure ancient british descent i verily doubt whether he could manage to better my humble style to my liking enough of that i felt doubts at beginning but i find myself stronger as i get on you may rely upon me now to leave the question to your own intelligence the proof of the pudding is in the eating and if any one fears that i cannot cook it i only beg him to wait and see lady bluett was taken so much with my bardie and the colonel the same though he tried at first to keep it under that nothing except their own warm kindness stopped them from making off with her the lady had vowed that she would do so for it would be so much for the little soul's good and of course so far as legality went the chief justice of the neighbourhood had more right to her than a common rough farmer but watty came down being sent by moxy after he went home with that shilling and must needs make show of it he came down shyly from habit of nature to the black eyebrows of the tide where the colonel and bardie were holding grand play with the top of the spring running up to them she was flying at the wink of every wave and trying to push him back into it and he was laughing with all his heart at her spry ways and audacity and the quickness of her smiles and frowns and the whole of her nature one whirl of play till he thought nothing more of his coat-tails what do you want here boy the colonel asked being not best pleased that a man of his standing should be caught in the middle of such antics watkin opened his great blue eyes and opened his mouth as well but could not get steerage way on his tongue being a boy of great reverence little fellow what are you come for with these words he smiled on the boy and was vexed with himself for frightening him oh sir oh sir if you please sir mother says as miss de la she must come home to bed sir e go a ye now e bad yatkin i ont more pay with my dear colonel yucca i am not at all sure said the colonel laughing that i shall not put her into my car and drive away with her watkin you may go home my good boy and tell your mother that we have taken this poor little dear to candleston this of course was lady bluett you should have seen watkin's face they told me when i came to hear of it betwixt his terror of giving offence and his ignorance how to express his meaning and the sorrow he felt on his mother's account and perhaps his own pain also not a word had he to say but made a grope after the baby's hands then the little child ran up to him and flung both arms around his leg and showed the stanchness of her breed 
could any one even of six years old better enter into it i yoves yatkin yatkin is i good and kind and i yoves poor moki i on't go away till my dear papa and my dear mamma comes for me lady bluett being quick and soft could not keep her tears from starting and the colonel said it must be so we might have done a great wrong my dear consider all and here he whispered out of watkins hearing and the lady nodded sadly having known what trouble is but the last words he spoke bravely god has sent her for a comfort where he saw that it was needed we must not give way to a passing fancy against a deep affliction only we will keep our eyes upon this little orphan darling End of chapter twenty three chapter twenty four of the maid of scar this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the maid of scar by r d blackmore chapter twenty four sound investments the spring tides led me to scar the next day and being full early for the ebb i went in to see what the colonel had done for if he should happen to take up the child she would pass out of my hands altogether which might of course be a serious injury as well as a very great hardship for of moxy's claim i had little fear if it came to a question of title inasmuch as i had made her sign a document prepared and copied by myself clearly declaring my prior right in virtue of rescue and providential ordinance but as against colonel lower i durst not think of asserting my claims even if the law were with me and not only so but i felt all along that the matter was not one for money to heal but a question of the deepest feelings and now the way in which moxy came out while bardie was making much of me who always saw everything first of course and the style of her meddling in between us led me to know that a man has no chance to be up to the tricks of a female for the dialogue going on between us was of the very simplest nature as you may judge by the following i a been so long o oh, davy afore i come to see poor bardie because my pretty dear i've been forced to work all day long almost hasn't a had no time to pay no my dear not a moment to play work 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 money 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 till old davy is quite worn out i may have put horns to the truth in this but at any rate not very long ones and the child began to ponder it i tell a old davy hot to do susan say to me one day kite yell i a member ickle bardie made a money does a sink so i think you are made of gold you beauty and of diamonds and the revelations i yell then i tell a hot to do take poor bardie to marcus old davy and he get a great big money for her she must have seen some famous market for acting everything as she did by means of working face arms and legs she put herself up like a fowl in a basket and spread herself making the most of her breast and limping her neck as the dead chickens do before i could begin to laugh moxy was upon us die you why for you come again never you used to come like this put down de luce directly moment no fish she is for you to catch when you might have had her here you left her through the face of everything and now because great evan's staff is cloven by the will of god who takes not advantage of him i thought you would have known better dio and this little one that he dotes upon it is enough i answered with a dignity which is natural to me when females wound my feelings madam thomas it is enough i will quit your premises 
with these words i turned away and never looked over my shoulder even though the little one screamed after me until i felt waddy hard upon my stern and like a kedge anchor dragging therefore i let them apologize till my desire was to forgive them and after they brought forth proper things i denied all evil will and did my best to accomplish it mrs thomas returning slowly to her ancient style with me as i relaxed my dignity said that now the little maid was getting more at home with them mr thomas after what had happened in the neighbourhood this was the death of her five sons felt naturally low of spirit and it was good for him to have a lively child around him he did not seem quite what he was and nothing brought him to himself so much as to watch this shadow of life although she was still afraid of him every word of this was clear to me it meant ten times what it expressed because our common people have a height of kindness some would say and some a depth of superstition such as leads them delicately to slope off their meaning but in my blunt and sailor fashion i said that black evan must i feared be growing rather shaky i had better have kept this opinion quiet for moxy bestowed on me such a gaze of pity mingled with contempt that knowing what sort of a man he had been i felt all abroad about everything all i could say to myself was this that the only woman of superior mind i ever had the luck to come across and carefully keep clear of had taken good care not to have a husband supposing there had been the occasion and i think i made mention of her before because she had been thrice disappointed and all she said was true almost however scarhouse might say just what it pleased while i had my written document and unless she herself as they stupidly called her by corruption of andalusia was not inclined to abandon me and now she made them as jealous as could be for she clung to me fast with one hand while she spread the beautiful tiny fingers of the others to moxy as much as to say interrupt me not i have such a lot of things to tell old davy and so she had without any mistake and the vast importance of each matter lost nothing for want of emphasis patty green had passed through a multitude of most surprising adventures some of them even transcending her larceny of my sugar waddy had covered himself with glory and above all little dutch the sheep-dog was now become a most benevolent and protecting power hot's a think old davy patty geen been yecked she has yecked i don't know what that is my dear ness i said yecked old davy yecked down ne'er same as barty was it was clear that she now had taken up with the story which everybody told and she seemed rather proud of having been wrecked and patty she went on quite out of breath patty's poiled all her boofly coves such a mess he never see a most and poor patty go to e back pit hole till e boofly dush yun all into e yadder oh and dutch pulled her out again did she ness and her head come kite out of her neck but yet he put e goo pot on and make it much better than ever a'most now delushy what a child you are cried mrs thomas proudly you never told mr llewellyn that you ran into the sea yourself to save your doll and drownded you must have been but for our watkin bardie poyle her coves she said looking rather shy about it bardie coves not boofly now not same as they used to be but if she regretted her change of apparel she had ceased by this time moxy said to fret much for her father and mother for watkin or some one had inspired her with a most comforting idea to wit that her parents had placed her there for the purpose of growing faster 
and that when she had done her best to meet their wishes in this respect they would suddenly come to express their pride and pleasure at her magnitude little brother also would appear in state and so would susan and find it needful to ascend the dairy stool to measure her as at present her curly head was scarcely up to the mark of that stool the duty of making a timely start in this grand business of growing became at once self-evident to be a great big gal was her chief ambition inasmuch as han i's a gate big gal mamma and papa be so peased and say hot a good gal e is barty to do as i tell a often when her heart was heavy in the loneliness of that house and the loss of all she loved and with dirty things around her the smile would come back to her thoughtful eyes and she would open her mouth again for the coarse but wholesome food which was to make a big gal of her believing herself now well embarked toward this desired magnitude she had long been making ready for the joy it would secure e come and see old davy i so a somethin she whispered to me when she thought the others were not looking so i gave a wink to moxy thomas whose misbehaviour i had overlooked and humouring the child i let her lead me to her sacred spot this was in an unused passage with the end door nailed to jams and black oak panelling along it and a floor of lias stone none in the house durst enter it except this little creature at least unless there were three or four to hearten one another and a strong sun shining the abbot's walk was its proper name because a certain abbot of neath who had made too much stir among the monks received as we say his quietus there during a winter excursion and in spite of all the masses said could not keep his soul at rest therefore his soul came up and down and that is worse than a dozen spirits for the soul can groan but the spirit is silent into this dark lonely passage i was led by a little body too newly inhabited by spirit to be at all afraid of it and she came to a cupboard door and tugged and made a face as usual when the button was hard to move but as for allowing me to help her not a bit of it if you please with many grunts and jerks of breath at last she fetched it outward having made me promise first not to touch however grand and tempting might be the scene disclosed to me what do you think was there collected and arranged in such a system that no bee could equal it why every bit of everything that every one who loved her which amounts to everybody ever had bestowed upon her for her own sweet use and pleasure since ashore she came to us not a lollipop was sucked not a bit of taffy tasted not a plaything had been used but just enough to prove it all were set in portions four two of which were double-sized of what the other two were nearly half these things had come i am almost sure from newton and among the choicest treasures which were stored in scallop shells i described one of my own buttons which i had honestly given her because two eyelets had run together item a bowl of an unsmoked pipe which had snapped in my hand one evening item as sure as i am alive every bit of the sugar which the dolly had taken from out my locker times there are when a hardy man at sense of things however childish which have left their fibre in him finds himself or loses self in a sudden softness so it almost was with me though the bait of my hooks all the time was drying and for no better reason than the hopeless hopes of a very young child i knew what all her storehouse meant before she began to tell me and her excitement while she told me scarcely left her breath to speak not for papa with the keen pipe to moke and not for mamma with e boofly buckin for her coke and not for my dear ickle bother because it just fit in between his teeth and this with e ooking gas for susan because she do her hair all day yong 
she held up the little bit of tin and mimicked susan's self-adornment making such a comic face and looking so conceited that i felt as if i should know her susan anywhere in a hundred of women if only she should turn up so and i began to smile a little and she took it up tenfold e make me yaff so i do declare e silly o davy i doesn't know how to do a'most but e mustn't tell anybody this i promised and so went a-fishing wondering what in the world would become of the queerest fish i had ever caught as well as the highest flavoured one it now seemed a toss-up whether or not something or other might turn up in the course of one's life about her at any rate she was doing well with her very bright spirits to help her and even black evan so broken down as not to be hard upon any one and as things fell out to take me from her without any warning upon the whole it was for the best to find the last sight comfortable and a man of my power must not always be poking after babies even the best that were ever born tush what says king david who was a great-grandfather of mine less distant than llewellyn harper but as much respected in spite of his trying to contribute jewish blood to the lot of us in some of his rasher moments but ancestor though we acknowledge him when our neighbourhood has a revival i will not be carried away by his fame to copy so much as to hearken him the autumn now grew fast upon us and the beach was shifting and neither room nor time remained for preaching under the sand-hills even if any one could be found with courage to sit under them and as the nights turned cold and damp everybody grumbled much which was just and right enough in balance of their former grumbling at the summer drought and heat and it was mainly this desire not to be behind my neighbours in the comfort and the company of grumbling and exchanging grumbles which involved me in a course of action highly lowering to my rank and position in society but without which i could never have been enabled to tell this story and yet before entering on that subject everybody will want to know how i discharged my important and even arduous duties as trustee through sir philip's munificence for both those little children in the first place i felt that my position was strictly confidential and that it would be a breach of trust to disclose to any person especially in a loquacious village a matter so purely of private discretion three parties there were to be considered and only three whatever point of view one chose to take of it the first of these was sir philip the second the two children and the third of course myself to the first my duty was gratitude which i felt and admitted abundantly to the second both zeal and integrity and for myself there was one course only to which i am naturally addicted namely a lofty self-denial this duty to myself i discharged at once by forming a stern resolution not to charge either of those children so much as a single farthing for taking care of her property until she was twenty-one years of age then as regards the second point i displayed my zeal immediately by falling upon bunny soon after daylight and giving her a small tooth combing to begin with till the skin of her hair was as bright as a prawn after which without any heed whatever of roars or even kicks i took a piece of holy stone and after a rinsing of soda upon her i cleaned down her planking to such a degree that our admiral might have inspected her she was clean enough for a captain's daughter before and dandy trimmed more than need have been for a little craft built to be only a coaster but now when her yelling had done her good and her sunday frock was shipped and her black hair spanked with a rose-coloured ribbon and the smiles flowed into her face again with the sense of all this smartness sir philip himself would have thought her consistent with the owner of five pounds sterling 
and as touching the money itself and the honesty rightly expected from me although the sum now in my hands was larger than it ever yet had pleased the lord to send me for out and out my own nevertheless there was no such thing as leading me astray about it and this was the more to my credit because that power of evil who has more eyes than all the angels put together or at any rate keeps them wider open he came aft seeing how the wind was and planted his hoof within half a plank of the tiller of my conscience but i heaved him overboard at once and laid my course with this cargo of gold exactly as if it were shipper's freight under bond and covenant although in downright common sense having bunny for my grandchild i also possessed beyond any doubt whatever belonged to bunny just as the owner of a boat owns the oar and rudder also and the same held true as most people would think concerning bardie's property for if i had not saved her life how could she have owned any so far however from dealing thus i not only kept all their money for them but invested it in the manner which seemed to be most for their interest to this intent i procured a book for three halfpence paid out of mine own pocket wherein i declared a partnership and established a fishing association under the name style and description of bardie bunny llewellyn and company to this firm i contributed not only my industry and skill but also nets tackle rods and poles hooks and corks and two kettles for bait and a gridiron fit to land and cook with also several well-proven pipes and a perfectly sound tobacco-box every one of these items and many others i entered into the ledger of partnership and mother jones being strange to much writing recorded her mark at the bottom of it one stroke with one hand and one with the other believing it to be my testament with an amen coming after it but knowing what the tricks of fortune are and creditors so unreasonable i thought it much better to keep my boat outside of the association if the firm liked they might hire it and have credit until distribution day which i fixed for the first day of every three months my partners had nothing to provide except just an anchor a mast and a lug sail a new net or two because mine were wearing and one or two other trifles perhaps scarcely worth describing for after all who could be hard upon them when all they contributed to the firm was fifteen pounds and ten shillings it was now in the power of both my partners to advance towards fortune to permit very little delay before they insisted on trebling their capital and so reinvest it in the firm and hence at the age of twenty-one be fit to marry magistrates and i made every preparation to carry their shares of the profits over nevertheless things do not always follow the line of the very best and soundest calculations the fish that were running up from the mumbles fast enough to wear their fins out all of a sudden left off altogether as if they had heard of the association not even a tuppenny glass of grog did i ever take out of our capital nor a night of the week did i lie abed when the lines required attendance however when fish are entirely absent the very best fishermen in the world cannot manage to create them and therefore our partnership saw the wisdom of declaring no dividends for the first quarter End of chapter twenty four chapter twenty five of the maid of scar this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the maid of scar by r d blackmore chapter twenty five a long good-bye 
it is an irksome task for a man who has always stood upon his position and justified the universal esteem and respect of the neighbourhood to have to recount his own falling off and loss of proper station without being able to render for it any cause or reason except indeed his own great folly with fortune too ready to second it however as every downfall has a slope which leads towards it so in my case small downhills led treacherously to the precipice in the first place the dogfish and the stingrays which alone came into the nets of our new association set me swearing very hard which of course was a trifling thing and must have befallen st peter himself whose character i can well understand but what was wrong in me was this that after it went on for a fortnight and not even a conjure turned up i became proud of my swearing with practice instead of praying to be forgiven which i always feel done to me if desired for my power of words began to please me which was a bait of the devil no doubt as every tide i felt more and more that married life had not deprived me of my gift of language or at any rate that widowship had restored my vigour promptly after this being a little exhausted for two days and two nights i smoked pipes not in any mood soever unfit for a christian quite the contrary and quite ready to submit to any discipline being ordered also to lay by and expect a sign from heaven and at this time came several preachers although i had very little for them and was grieved to disappoint their remembrance of the ham that my wife used to keep in cut and in so many words i said that now i was bound to the church by a contract of a shilling a week and if they waited long enough they might hear the clock strike something this combined with a crab whose substance had relapsed to water and the sign of nothing in my locker except a pint of peppermint induced these excellent pastors to go and if they shook off as they declared the dirt of their feet at me it must have been much to their benefit this trifle however heaped up my grievance although i thought scorn to think of it and on the back of it there came another wrong far more serious tidings to wit of a wretched warrant being likely to issue against me from that low tyrant anthony stew on a thoroughly lying information by one of his own gamekeepers it was true enough that i went through his wood with a couple of sailors from portcall by no means with any desire to harm but to see if his game was healthy few things occur that exalt the mind more than natural history and if a man dare not go into a wood how can he be expected to improve his knowledge though other men perhaps employed their means to obtain a more intimate acquaintance with the structure and methods of various creatures going on two legs or going on four but as for myself not so much as a gun did any one see in my hands that day at first i thought of standing it out on the strength of all my glory but knowing what testimony is when it gets into the mouths of gamekeepers and feeling my honour concerned to say nothing of the other fellows who were off to sea also cherishing much experience by the way Stu handled me upon the whole i had half a mind to let the neighbourhood and the county learn to feel the want of me also what joe jenkins said perhaps had some effect on me this was a young fellow of great zeal newly appointed to zoar chapel instead of the steady nathaniel edwards who had been caught sheep-stealing and inasmuch as the chapel stood at the western end of the village next door to the welcome to town my lads all the maids of newton ran mightily to his doctrine for he happened to be a smart young fellow and it was largely put abroad that an uncle of his had a butter-shop without any children and bringing in four pounds a week at 
chepstow there is scarcely a day of my life on which i do not receive a lesson and the difference betwixt me and a fool is that i receive and he scorns it and a finer lesson i have rarely had than for letting joe jenkins into my well-conducted cottage for no better reason than that the welcome to town was out of beer i ought to have known much better of course with a fellow too young to shave himself and myself a good hearty despiser of schism and above all having such a fine connection with the church of england but that fellow had such a tongue they said it must have come out of the butter i gave him a glass of my choicest rum when all he deserved was a larruping and i nearly lost the church clock through it when i heard of this serious consequence i began to call to mind too late what the chaplain of the spitfire thirty two gun raisy always used to say to us and a fine fellow to stand to his guns whenever it came to close quarters i never saw before or since go down parson go down we said sir this is no place for your cloth sneaking schismatics may skulk he answered with the powder mop in his hand for we had impressed a methody who bolted below at exceeding long range but if my cloth is out of its place i'll fight the devil naked this one over to the side of the church every man of our crew that was gifted with any perception of reasoning however i never shall get on if i tell all the fine things i have seen only i must set forth how i came to disgrace myself so deeply that i could not hope for years and years to enjoy the luxury of despising so much as a lighter man again the folk of our parish could hardly believe it and were it to be done in any way consistent with my story i would not put it on paper now but here it is make the worst of it you will find me redeem it afterwards the famous david llewellyn of his majesty's royal navy took a berth in a trading schooner called the rose of devon after such a fall as this if i happen to speak below my mark or not describe the gentry well everybody must excuse me for i went so low in my own esteem that i could not have knocked even anthony stew's underkeeper down i was making notes here and there already concerning the matters at scar house and the delicate sayings of bardie not with any view to a story perfect and clear as this is but for my own satisfaction in case of anything worth going on with and but for this forethought you could not have learned both her sayings and doings so bright as above and now being taken away from it i tried to find some one with wit enough to carry it on in my absence in a populous neighbourhood this might have been but the only man near us who had the conceit to try to carry it on a bit fell into such a condition of mind that his own wife did not know him but in spite of the open state of his head he held on very stoutly trying to keep himself up to the mark with ale and even hollands until it pleased god that his second child should fall into the chicken pot and then all the neighbours spoke up so much on account of his being a tailor that it came to one thing or the other either he must give up his trade and let his apprentice have it to think of which was worse than gall and wormwood to his wife or else he must give up all meddling with pen and ink and the patterns of chicken-pox how could he hesitate when he knew that the very worst tailor can make in a day as much as the best writer can in a month upon the whole i was pleased with this for i never could bear that rogue of a snip any more than he could put up with me for making my own clothes and bunnies i challenged him once on a buttonhole for i was his master without a thimble and for this ninth part of a man to think of taking up my pen 
the name of our schooner or rather ketch for she was no more than that to tell truth though i wished her to be called a schooner was as i said the rose of devon and the name of her captain was fuzzy not a bad man i do believe but one who almost drove me wicked because i never could make him out a tender and compassionate interest in the affairs of everybody whom it pleases providence that we should even hear of has been since our ancestors baffled the flood without consulting noah one of the most distinct and noblest national traits of welshmen pious also for if the lord had not meant us to inquire he never would have sent us all those fellow-creatures to arouse unallayed disquietude but this man fuzzy as every one called him although his true name was bethel jose seemed to be sent from devonshire for the mere purpose of distracting us concerning the other two stone captains as we call those skippers who come for limestone and steal it from colonel lower's rocks we knew as much as would keep us going whenever their names were mentioned but as to fuzzy though this was the third year of his trading over there was not a woman in newton who knew whether he had a wife or not and the public eagerness over this subject grew as the question deepened until there were seven of our best young women ready to marry him at risk of bigamy to find out the matter and to make it known therefore of course he rose more and more in public esteem voyage after voyage and i became jealous perhaps of his fame and resolved to expose its hollow basis as compared with that of mine accordingly when it came to pass that my glory though still in its prime was imperilled by that irish stew's proceedings for he must have been irish by origin having my choice as a matter of course among the three stone captains i chose that very hard stone to crack and every one all through the village rejoiced though bitterly grieved to lose me and dreading the price there would be for fish with that extortionate sandy macraw left alone to create a monopoly there was not a man in all newton that feared to lay half a crown to a sixpence that i brought back the whole of old fuzzy's concerns but the women having tried skipper jose with everything they could think of and not understanding the, the odds of betting were ready to lay a crooked sixpence on fuzzy whenever they had one to begin with he caught me on the hop at a moment of rumours and serious warnings and thoroughly pure indignation on my part at the moment i said and he made me sign that i was prepared to ship with him after which he held me fast and frightened me with the land crabs and gave me no chance to get out of his jaws i tried to make him laugh with some of the many jokes and stories which everybody knows of mine and likes them for long acquaintance sake however not one of them moved him so much as to fetch one squirt of tobacco juice this alone enabled him to take a strong lead over me every time that he was bound to laugh according to human nature and yet had neither a wag in his nose nor a pucker under his countenance nor even so much as a gleam in his eye so many times i felt in my heart that this man was the wise man and that laughter is a folly and i had to bottle down the laughs which always rise inside of me whenever my joke has the cream on it until i could find some other fellow fit to understand me because i knew that my jokes were good when i found no means of backing out from that degrading contract my very first thought was to do strict justice to our association and atone for the loss of my services to it therefore in case of anything undesirable befalling me in short if i should be ordered aloft with no leave to come down again there i made my will and left my property to establish credit for a new start among them chairs and tables knives and forks iron spoons 
brought into the family by my wife's grandfather several pairs of duds of my own and sundry poles as before described also nets to a good extent though some had gone under usury bait kettles i forget how many and even my character in a silk bag item a great many sundry things of almost equal value the whole of which i bravely put into my will and left them and knowing that the proper thing is to subscribe a codicil therein i placed a set of delf and after that my blessing eighteen pence i was compelled to pay for this pious document to a man who had been turned out of the law because he charged too little and a better shilling and sixpence worth of sense with heads and tails to it his lordship the bishop of landaff will own that he never set seal upon unless i make another one only i felt it just to leave my boat entire to bardie having done my duty thus i found a bracing strength upon me to go through with everything no man should know how much i felt my violent degradation from being captain of a gun to have to tread mercantile boards things have changed since then so much through the parsimony of government that our very best sailors now tail off into the merchant service but it was not so when i was young and even when i was turned up fifty we despised the traders even the largest of their vessels of four or as much as five hundred tons we royal tars regarded always as so many dustbins with three of the clothes props hoisted and now as i looked in the glass i beheld no more than the mate of a fifty-ton ketch for a thirty-mile voyage out of newton bay however i had lived long enough then to be taught one simple thing whatever happens one may descry merely by using manly aspect dawning glimpses of that light which the will of god intended to be joy for all of us but so scattered now and vapoured by our own misdoings still it will come home some time and then we call it comfort accordingly though so deeply fallen in my own regard i did not find that people thought so very much the less of me nay some of them even drove me wild by talking of my rise in life as if i had been a pure nobody but on the whole we learned my value when i was going away from us for all the village was stirred up with desire to see the last of me my well-known narratives at the well would be missed all through the autumn and those who had dared to call them lies were the foremost to feel the lack of them especially the children cried old davy going to be drownded no more stories at the well until i vowed to be back almost before they could fill their pitchers these things having proved to me in spite of inordinate modesty that i had a certain value i made the very best of it and let everybody know how much i wished to say good-bye to them although so short of money from felix farley i had received no less than seven and tenpence for saving the drowned black people under initials d l at the office accruing to a great extent from domestic female servants some of these craved my candid opinion as to accepting the humble addresses of coloured gentlemen in good livery and whether it made so much difference and now i thought that newton might have a mark of esteem prepared for me but though they failed to think of that purely from want of experience everything else was done that could be done for a man who had no money by his neighbours who had less and sixpence never entered twice into the thoughts of any one richard matthews the pilot promised to mind the church clock for me without even handling my salary as for bunny glorification is the shortest word i know a young man who had never paid his bill put her into two-inch ribbon from the baptist preacher's shop 
also a pair of shoes upon her which had right and left to them although not marked by nature and upon the front of her bosom lace that made me think of smuggling and such as that young man never could have expected to get booked to him if he had felt himself to be more than a month converted moreover instead of mother jones who was very well in her way to be sure the foremost folk in all the village and even master charles morgan himself carpenter and churchwarden were beginning to vie one with the other in desire to entertain her without any word of her five-pound note in short many kind things were said and done enough to make any unbashful man desire to represent them but i for my part was quite overcome and delivered my speech with such power of doubt concerning my own worthiness that they had to send back to the inn three times before they could properly say good-bye chapter twenty five